The war to end all wars, the end of history. These are some of the optimistic terms coined by historians arguing at the time that we had reached or were about to reach a state of peace following cataclysmic events like World War I and the Cold War. Unfortunately, these predictions did not come true. At no point in history did human beings stop fighting each other for power, resources, influence, glory, or out of revenge. There are hundreds of conflicts going on in the world right now, hot and frozen, big and small, of global importance or local. In this video, we have taken upon ourselves the tough task of overviewing all current armed conflicts in the world. Since there are and have been so many conflicts in the world, we need to set some ground rules for what exactly we are considering a conflict for the purposes of this video. Our criteria are the following. A. It has to be an armed conflict, peaceful protests, or even violent protests without the actual and persistent use of lethal weapons on both sides do not make the cut. B. It can be an internal armed conflict between the state and opposition slash rebels slash separatists etc, not necessarily between two states. C. It can be both an active or a frozen conflict. Any armed conflict which has not reached a final conclusion or has a clear potential to reignite will be considered. We also hope for your understanding. Since we intend to mention each and every conflict fitting the above standards in this video, you should excuse us for not touching upon every aspect of each conflict and talking about them in depth. If we missed a conflict, please add it in the comments. And if this list isn't enough for you, go out and start some more wars in the sponsor of this video, Conflict of Nations. It's a real-time grand strategy game, and we mean real-time. You give your orders, then they take place over real days and weeks, giving you time to strategize in extreme detail and interact with up to 128 other players in your match doing the same over this long time frame. But there's one special conflict to get into in the game right now, the new Civil War Battlegrounds USA scenario where the Conflict of Nations formula is applied to a war between the freshly independent American states. Think you can handle command of the much vaunted new American civil war? There's the economy, military technology, diplomacy and alliances, and of course the endless choices for where and when to deploy your units. To help, you can also access the game on your phone to update your plans and see what your rivals are doing anytime. Get the game for free via our link in the description to get an exclusive gift. 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free, but only for the next 30 days, so act now. Two of the most prosperous countries in the world, the United States of America and Canada, are situated on this continent and have not had an armed conflict on their hands for over a century. However, once we include Central American states and the Caribbean Basin countries, the situation changes. Many of these countries are still experiencing internal political problems and violent protests, but the good news is that there is no active or frozen armed interstate or intrastate conflicts in those countries. We may think of Mexico as an exception here. Although Mexico is in general a politically and economically stable country, it has had its fair share of internal conflicts. The Chiapas conflict between the state and the Zapatista movement, headed by famous subcomandante Marcos, which demanded recognition of indigenous rights and their ownership over communal lands, started in 1994, and despite several agreements between the sides, lasted until 2020. The issue has not been fully resolved, and the conflict has already taken the lives of more than 300 people. Nevertheless, since August 2020, there has been no systemic violence related to this conflict. The Mexican drug war is another protracted conflict which has been fought for decades between the Mexican government and drug cartels on one side and among the cartels on the other side. Mexican drug cartels saw their influence grow after the demise of their Colombian colleagues. They have been fighting for turf and influence amongst themselves ever since. For a while, the internal drug wars had been largely ignored by the Mexican government. But in 2006, the newly elected president, Felipe Calderón, sent in the army to deal with the cartels and violence caused by them. The United States government has been actively assisting Mexico in this war with the cartels. Dozens of years, thousands of arrests and deaths later, the war goes on, despite the statement of President López Obrador about the end of the war on drugs in 2019. When the government arrests cartel leaders, 
gang members fight amongst themselves to take the vacant spot. When the government stops, it becomes easier for cartels to prosper. Thus, the cycle of violence continues with no end in sight. South American countries have been experiencing similar types of conflicts. Internal conflicts fought between the state and paramilitary groups, along with wars fought against drug cartels. For more than half a century, Colombia has been a stage of the war between the state and leftist militia organizations, which drug cartels and rightist militia organizations later joined in an environment of ever-shifting alliances. Colombia is one of the largest cocaine exporters in the world, and the fight against drug cartels has often intertwined with the war against leftist groups like FARC. Both the left and right have been involved in drug trafficking. Both of them have fought or collaborated with cartels at times. The drug-related violence in Colombia peaked in the 1980s and 90s with all sides, including the government, accused of human rights violations and massacres. You know all about this from the hit TV show Narcos. While the level of drug-related violence in Colombia is not at the level it was in the Escobar era, it still persists. The Colombian government has been trying to fight drug trafficking by using both the proverbial carrot and stick, but has faced similar difficulties as in Mexico. The drug trade is just too lucrative, with many people ranging from cocoa cultivating farmers to cartel gunmen profiting from it and the violent response from the government seems to solve one issue to sometimes create two others. There is no active drug war going on in Colombia now, but the low-intensity conflict persists. The same is largely true for the war against FARC and other leftist militant groups. For decades, a communist organization named FARC waged a guerrilla war against the government, until in 2016 they signed a peace agreement with the government, with most of the members laying down their arms. But some guerrillas decided to continue fighting, although the threat caused by them to the government is insignificant at this point. There is also a smaller conflict fought between the remaining leftist armed groups in Colombia. Overall, according to the National Center of Historical Memory report of 2013, the conflict in Colombia had killed 220,000 people over 55 years at that point. A similar conflict occurred in Peru as well. Throughout the 1980s and the 1990s, the Maoist Shining Path militant organization waged a guerrilla war against the Peruvian government. The government eventually gained the upper hand in this bitter conflict after the government captured several leaders of the Shining Path. Eventually, in 2000, Peru established the Truth and Reconciliation Commission to heal the wounds of a two decades long internal war. It reached a conclusion that almost 70,000 people were killed or disappeared in this period, with almost half of it being caused by the Shining Path. In the 21st century, the remnants of the militant organization have continued engaging in low-intensity guerrilla war against the Peruvian government, but its impact has been negligible. Since 2005, Paraguay has been fighting a similar type of leftist insurgency as well, but its impact has been much smaller. Finally, to wrap up the South American section of this video, we need to talk about Venezuela. This oil-rich country did not spiral into an internal conflict following the disputed 2018 presidential election, after which the opposition rejected the legitimacy of Nicolas Maduro and supported Juan Guaido's claim. Even though the opposition declared the creation of an interim government, which was recognized by most Western and Latin American countries, no shots were fired. However, there is another potential conflict currently brewing with Venezuelan involvement. Venezuela has long rejected Guyana's sovereignty over the Essequibo region, and in 2023 they held a sham internal referendum, in which the majority voted to recognize it as part of Venezuela. Since then, the Venezuelan military has been building up its capacity on the border with Guyana. The crisis has not been resolved, and it looks like it has a significant potential to turn into a hot war in the near future. The Venezuelan government has also been fighting against the Pemon indigenous people in the southeast over mining rights. Generally speaking, Oceania is one of the most peaceful continents. The biggest countries like Australia and New Zealand are essential members of the Western Coalition and regularly participate in US-led military operations around the world. However, their military capabilities are not causing any conflict in Oceania. Following the resolution of an ethnic conflict between the Gwale and Honiara people in the Solomon Islands, 
the West Papuan conflict remains the sole deadly conflict in Oceania. After the Indonesian victory in the revolution to oust their former colonial overlords, the Netherlands, in the 1940s, the new Indonesian government also laid claim on West Papua. At the same time, the Dutch insisted on retaining control over the island, with the intention of eventually allowing its independence. However, Indonesia was unhappy with this development, and by the 1960s, its army started making incursions into this territory. Eventually, it was agreed that a referendum would solve the fate of West Papua. In 1969, the referendum, which was criticized for being rigged and held at gunpoint by the Indonesian military, led to the incorporation of West Papua into Indonesia. The Papuans opposed this and have fought for secession under the leadership of the Free Papua Movement ever since. According to Amnesty International, more than 100,000 West Papuans have been killed in this conflict, which is still ongoing. The fall of the Berlin Wall and the Iron Curtain dividing Europe was going to usher the united Europe into a new era of peace and prosperity. At least this is what many people thought. But such monumental events like the end of the Cold War very often lead to major upheaval and reignition of old and seemingly forgotten conflicts. The collapse of Yugoslavia was one such upheaval and its destabilizing impact is still being felt. Slovenia, Croatia and Bosnia became independent through war with Serbia, which took an extremely brutal shape in the case of the latter two. North Macedonia and Montenegro became independent through peaceful secession. The independence of all these countries is universally accepted. Bosnia has been peaceful for more than two decades now, but the threat of separatism still exists in the country. The situation in Kosovo is different. For years after the collapse of Yugoslavia, the Albanian majority in Kosovo accused the Yugoslav government of repression and ethnic discrimination. They demanded independence, and after the emergence of the Kosovo Liberation Army as the driving force of this secessionist movement, the war started in 1998. The Yugoslav army retaliated strongly against the KLA, while also being accused of ethnic cleansing and genocide of the Albanian population. As a result, in 1999, NATO intervened in this conflict and launched an airstrike campaign on Yugoslavia. A few months later, the Yugoslavian government was forced to agree to remove its forces from Kosovo. The NATO peacekeeping contingent, called the Kosovo Force K4, entered Kosovo. At first, Kosovo got autonomy from Serbia, but in 2008, they went further to declare independence. Most European and Western countries have recognized Kosovo's independence, while many others, particularly those who are dealing with separatism, have rejected doing so. Serbians generally view Kosovo as an important part of their historical homeland, the place where the historic battles against the Ottomans took place. The current leader of Serbia, Aleksandar Vucic, rejects Kosovo's independence, and his rhetoric indicates that Serbia may be looking for an opportune geopolitical moment to strike. Kosovo still has a significant Serbian minority, which complains of ethnic discrimination. One of the most recent episodes of heightened tensions in mid-2023 demonstrates that the Kosovo conflict has not been fully resolved, as there is still a significant potential for escalation. The former Soviet Union is divided between Asia and Europe. It has been a common political space for 15 independent nations, all of which used to be part of the Russian Empire and then the Soviet Union. These countries have gone through similar types of political development, lived in the same economic system, and suffered through similar problems for decades. That is why, for the purposes of this video, we have decided to talk about the former Soviet Union countries in a separate section. Obviously, the war in Ukraine, which we have been covering extensively, is one of the two ongoing wars that have been drawing most of the global attention. In 2014, Russia illegally annexed Crimea and then started a war in Donbass together with its separatist proxies. A short-lived frozen conflict turned into a hot war in February 2022, when the Russian army invaded Ukraine. This war has exposed the Russian military, which was long believed to be the second strongest army in the world. It has suffered defeats in Kyiv, Kherson and Kharkiv, but has also managed important victories to capture swathes of Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia and Kherson oblasts, which Russia illegally annexed in late 2022. This phase of the war in Ukraine has been going on for more than two years, and there is no realistic prospect of peace at this point. Russia is playing a long game, ramping up its domestic military production, 
while Ukraine is hoping to get back to its 1991 internationally recognized borders with Western support. But this is not the only conflict in the former USSR that Russia has been directly involved in or has taken part in as an instigator. Moldova has lost control over part of its internationally recognized territory, Transnistria, in a war that took place in 1990-92. The Russian army stationed in Transnistria and, ironically, Ukrainian volunteers supported the separatists and the small Moldovan army was in no position to resist successfully. In 1992, a ceasefire agreement was signed and the Russian peacekeeping contingent was sent to Transnistria. Despite promises of withdrawing its army from Moldova, the Russian government has delayed it time and again under different pretexts. The war in Ukraine may have a further destabilizing effect on Moldova in general and Transnistria in particular. Georgia is still suffering from a Russian-supported separatism problem as well. Georgia fought wars in Abkhazia and South Ossetia to restore its control over these breakaway regions, but in both cases, Russian backing proved crucial as they became de facto independent states under the Kremlin's patronage. In 2008, Georgia was provoked into another war for South Ossetia, which gave Putin a pretext to send in troops. At the time, Georgia was actively working on NATO membership, and many believed that the Kremlin orchestrated the war to punish Tbilisi for its pro-Western aspirations. Predictably, Georgia was defeated in this short war. Neither separatist entity is recognized internationally, and are viewed as puppet regimes of Russia. A similar conflict arose in the Nagorno-Karabakh region of Azerbaijan in the early 1990s. As the Soviet Union was collapsing, the ethnic Armenian majority of the region demanded independence and then a merger with Armenia. The Armenians won the first war in 1994 with Russian support and occupied not only Nagorno-Karabakh but also seven adjacent districts. After years of fruitless negotiations and talks, in 2020, Azerbaijan took back control of most of the occupied territory in a 44-day war, before defeating the remnants of the separatist regime in Nagorno-Karabakh in September 2023 to restore control of all of its internationally recognized territories. Occasional border skirmishes still occur between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and although there has been some progress, the final peace agreement between the two South Caucasus nations has not been signed yet. An interesting detail here is that Russia has had a military base in Armenia ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, while its peacekeeping contingent has been deployed to Karabakh since the 2020 war. Many analysts have accused Russia of using its influence and military power to manipulate this conflict since its start. The Central Asian region of the former Soviet Union has been having its own share of interstate conflicts. Empires have rarely taken the ethnic, national and religious context into consideration when drawing up their administrative borders or dividing colonies among each other. These administrative borders often later become the borders of independent states, which often later becomes a source of conflict. Fergana Valley is a region that has been divided between Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. It also hosts several enclaves, a widespread remnant of the Soviet era. Water, natural resources and ethnic differences have been the source of tension in this region and have yet to be resolved. Border skirmishes also regularly occur between Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. The most recent escalation took place in 2022. Water resources and failure to determine borders are among the reasons causing these conflicts. Let's continue with Central Asia but go eastwards, out of the former USSR. Afghanistan has been battered by war since 1979. The Soviet invasion paved the way for internal strife, which led to the rise of the fundamentalist Taliban regime, and then to the American invasion at the start of its war on terror. But as most of you probably still remember, the exit of the American soldiers and the inability of the Afghan government to resist brought the Taliban back to power. Even though currently the Taliban is controlling the vast majority of Afghanistan, the National Resistance Front is still rejecting the new regime and is fighting to topple it. The geography of the war in Afghanistan has significantly diminished, but it has not stopped. Pakistan is another country that has been engaged in internal and external conflicts for decades now. When India and Pakistan got their independence from Britain, a war for the Muslim-majority Jammu and Kashmir regions immediately broke out in 1947. 
Since then, the disputed region has been divided between India and Pakistan, with the former ruling over most of it. The 1965 and 1971 wars, along with several other escalations, did not change the status quo much. Both countries still lay claim to this region, and now in possession of nuclear weapons, a war between these two sides has the potential to lead to catastrophic consequences. Pakistan is also fighting several internal conflicts. It has been fighting an Islamic fundamentalist insurgency in the northwest, led by the Pakistani Taliban, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other radical organizations since 2004. The fundamentalists took exception to Pakistan siding with the United States in its war on terror and have been waging a guerrilla war and terrorist attacks in Pakistan. The Hindu Kush mountain range has made it easier for militants to infiltrate Pakistan from Afghanistan. As a result, there have been moments in this war in which these terrorist organizations actually had control over swaths of Pakistani territory. But after initial setbacks, the Pakistani military has reclaimed all territories and has been working on solidifying their control over the border region. At this point, the conflict has turned into a low-intensity insurgency, but the Taliban's victory in Afghanistan has boosted the spirits of their Pakistani brethren. Another conflict that Pakistan has been dealing with since its independence is Baloch separatism. The several Baloch attempts at secession have been quelled by the Pakistani army, who is now dealing with a low-key insurgency. Iran also has a Baloch minority, also fighting for secession. Recently, in early 2024, this caused short-lived tension between Iran and Pakistan when both sides fired missiles on each other's territories, targeting the Baloch militants. So, while the Baloch question has not caused a major war in recent times, one can feel that there is a potential for an escalation. The Middle East has long had a reputation as the region with the most conflicts, and for a good reason. Unfortunately, there are just so many hot or low-intensity conflicts going on in the Middle East. Let's start with North Africa. The West Sahara conflict, which started in the 1970s, is yet to be resolved. The Polisario Front of the Sahrawi people, supported by Libya and Algeria, fought against Morocco and Mauritania for West Sahara. Morocco took control of most of the disputed territory in the war, which ended with the ceasefire in 1991. The Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, recognized by more than 40 countries, controls a quarter of the territory, with a claim to the rest as well. Since the ceasefire, the Sahrawis have continued campaigning for further international recognition, and there have been occasional skirmishes with the Moroccan army on the line of contact. The most recent escalation in 2020 left several soldiers dead on both sides, pointing to the fact that this conflict is far from over yet. Libya has been mired in internal strife ever since the Arab Spring. The country has been in a state of civil war since 2014. The UN-recognized Government of National Accord, supported by Turkey and Qatar, has been fighting against the Libyan National Army, supported by Russia, Egypt, the UAE and others. Neither side has managed to gain a decisive advantage over the other, and in 2020, the United Nations brokered a ceasefire between the opposing camps. In 2021, an interim unity government was formed, and a presidential election was declared, but it has not yet been held. At this point, there is a fragile peace in Libya. Lastly, almost all North African Arab countries are facing the Islamist insurgency fighting ISIS and other groups. This asymmetric war has been going on for almost two decades in some countries and has caused a great deal of death and destruction, along with giving the autocratic governments in this region a pretext to stifle the liberties of their people further. Much has already been said about the Israel-Palestine war, and we have been covering the ongoing escalation extensively. Just to give a brief reminder, the conflict started in 1948, and several wars, escalations and intifadas later, Israel controls most of the initially partitioned lands, occupies the West Bank, and is currently fighting in the Gaza Strip. Palestine still does not have an independent state, and its politics are divided as ever between the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas in the Gaza Strip. The currently ongoing war in Gaza has been devastating for the Palestinians, with tens of thousands of casualties already. But it has also demonstrated that the question of an independent Palestinian state is far from resolved. Several Arab states joined the Palestinians in their wars against Israel, and some of them are still at war with Israel. 
Even though Lebanon is trying to stay out of conflict with Israel, the Lebanese Hezbollah, supported by Iran, has been at war with Israel for a while now. As we speak, Israel and Hezbollah regularly exchange fire on the Israel-Lebanon border in a standoff, which has major escalatory potential. Israel is occupying the Golan Heights, which is internationally recognized as Syrian territory. Israel has also increased the regularity of airstrikes on Syria since the start of the war in Gaza. Speaking of Syria, the situation is not as tense and bloody as it was at the height of the civil war, but it is still extremely tricky and complicated. Supported by Russia and Iran, Bashar Assad has regained control of most of Syria, but the north is controlled by the opposition. The Syrian Democratic Forces, dominated by the Kurdish YPG and supported by the United States, control Raqqa, al hasaka Manbij and other regions in the north, while Turkey and opposition groups supported by it control Idlib, Afrin and Ras al -Ain. ISIS and other terrorist groups are also still active. The Syrian civil war is far from reaching a lasting conclusion, with so many internal and external forces seeking different agendas. Iraq has not had a civil war like in Syria, but its government is facing a similar type of situation. Even though the vast majority of American troops have left Iraq, they still have military bases in the country, which the pro-Iranian and anti-American forces in Iraq have regularly targeted. ISIS still keeps its presence in Iraq as well. North Iraq is ruled by Kurdish autonomy, which is formerly under Iraqi sovereignty, but is de facto independent. They have been trying to secede from Iraq for quite some time now. At this point, Kurds have autonomy in Syria and Iraq, but they are also in active rebellion in the Turkish southeast and Iranian northwest, demanding secession or autonomy. Finally, let's talk about Yemen. This country has lived through several civil wars and internal conflicts in the 20th century, but after a brief period of hope and enthusiasm following the unification of Yemen, the country descended into yet another civil war in 2014. The tensions between the south and the north of the country, poor governance of the personalist regime, sectarian divides, and foreign meddling by countries like Saudi Arabia are among the causes of the still ongoing civil war. At this point, the Houthi movement is controlling North Yemen, while the Saudi-supported government is in charge of the south. The Houthi territory has been under constant Saudi airstrikes for years, which have caused massive casualties and suffering. This has not prevented the Houthis from declaring war on Israel and targeting military and commercial vessels in the Red Sea in connection with the war in Gaza. Most of the geopolitical events in these regions circulate around China and India. These two main challengers to Pax Americana are involved in several conflicts in their neighborhoods. China has several land disputes with Bhutan, Japan, Vietnam and India, but only the latter has caused tensions in recent years. China and India have yet to reach an agreement on several pieces of borderland and have had bloody incidents in the 20th and 21st centuries. These two nuclear powers have found a way to make sure that tensions do not escalate to anything major by ensuring that firearms are not used in occasional skirmishes in the disputed border areas. The most recent round of confrontation took place in 2020 to 2022, and even though firearms were not used, dozens of soldiers died on each side in skirmishes, where soldiers used batons, clubs, stones, and other makeshift weapons. Both countries are claiming regional leadership, so there is some potential for escalation, but so far, the sides have managed to keep the tensions from rising. But there are two conflicts in which China is involved that have major explosive potential on the global scale. One of them is with Taiwan. After the Kuomintang defeat in the Chinese Civil War, its leadership and troops evacuated to Taiwan to create a de facto independent state. Only a few countries officially recognize Taiwan as independent, in fear of damaging their relations with a much more politically and economically powerful China. Still, the Western coalition, led by the United States, de facto has solid relations with Taiwan, and has reiterated its intention of protecting Taiwan from China. In August 2022, Congress Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan to express American support, which was met with outrage by the Chinese leadership. China has always seen Taiwan as its territory, and with the rise of its geopolitical ambitions following the ascent of Xi Jinping to leadership, China has made it very clear that it intends to solve the Taiwan issue once and for all. 
So far, China has responded by conducting two military exercises in the Taiwan Straits in 2022 and 2023. But with the ongoing crisis of the global order, it is not implausible to think that China may choose a military option. Along with the border dispute with China and the war with Pakistan, which we already mentioned, India is also fighting several insurgencies on its soil. The Indian government has been fighting the Naxalite Maoist rebels in the central and eastern states of the country since 1967. They have succeeded in containing this threat, but sporadic fighting between the government forces and rebels still occurs. The same is largely true with regard to the insurgency in northeastern Indian states. The war between North Korea and South Korea has been a frozen conflict for more than 70 years now. The side signed an armistice in 1953, which has functioned as a de facto border between the countries. Even though deadly incidents are a rare occurrence in this war since the signing of the armistice, occasional shelling sometimes leads to casualties. For instance, in 2010, North Korean shelling killed two soldiers and two civilians. Moreover, both countries spent significant sums to keep their armies ready for a potential conflict. This is especially true for North Korea, a highly militarized state currently in possession of nuclear weapons. A geopolitical earthquake like the one we are currently experiencing has the potential to push the Korean War back into a hot phase. Another country in Southeast Asia which has been ridden by internal conflict for decades now is Myanmar. This country has dozens of ethnic and religious groups, and the history of military coups and brutal military dictatorship are all factors which have been among the causes of these internal conflicts. The Myanmar military and Buddhist mobs have been accused of committing genocide against Rohingya Muslims since 2016. Tens of thousands of Muslims have been killed in these atrocities. The crisis in Myanmar deteriorated further with the 2021 military coup. The opposition rejected the hunter's rule and started fighting back. Simultaneously, various ethnic groups attacked by the hunter military created their own paramilitary forces to defend themselves. This bloody war is still going on, but in late 2023 and early 2024, the opposition forces have managed to make important gains, and some argue that the tide of the war may now be changing in their favor. Thailand is mostly known as a tropical tourist paradise, but it has also had its fair share of disturbance and political instability in the past decades. It is fighting an active insurgency in the south of the country as well. Four southern provinces of Thailand bordering Malaysia have a Malay-speaking Muslim majority. For decades in the 20th century, they have accused Thailand of conducting assimilation and not recognizing their minority rights. Gradually, the southern demands started manifesting themselves in the shape of an armed insurgency, which eventually became quite powerful. By now, it has turned into an Islamist insurgency, with ethnic goals becoming inseparable from the religious agenda of the insurgents. The Thai government has used both violent and diplomatic methods to contain and defeat the insurgency, but it is still active. Having said that, it is important to recognize that the official annual death toll caused by the southern insurgency has been way below three-digit numbers since 2017. The prospects of peace and non-violent resolution of this conflict have heightened following the direct talks held between the sides in 2020 and 2021. Finally, there is the Sabah North Borneo conflict between Malaysia and the Philippines. This territory is recognized as part of Malaysia, but Manila also has claims to it. This has been a source of instability at times, while piracy and the Islamist insurgency have added another layer of complexity to the issue. The Malaysian government has managed to contain the latter too, while the dispute with the Philippines has been kept under control to prevent any significant escalation between the sides. There are currently 35 armed conflicts of different scales and natures going on in sub-Saharan Africa, which has had a devastating effect on numerous countries and their populations. Above, we already mentioned the problems that Islamist fundamentalism has been causing in North Africa, but it has spilled over further south too. In Mali, the Tuareg rebels launched an insurgency to gain independence in the north in 2011. Later, Islamist Tuareg groups also joined the fight against the government, with the goal of establishing Sharia law in the rebel-controlled areas. This caused strife within the rebel ranks, as non-Islamists started fighting the Ansardine and other Islamist groups. Eventually, in 2013, the French army intervened on the government's side. 
This helped to push back the rebels and take back some of the lost territory. Since then, the French and Malian governments have been fighting the Islamist insurgency together, but France's history in Africa made its presence in Mali unpopular in the country. In 2022, following a coup in Mali, France started withdrawing from the country, and the vacuum is currently filled by Russian mercenary groups like Wagner. The Tuareg rebels still control significant land in the north, as any attempts for a peace agreement have failed so far. Jihadism spread to other Sahel countries like Burkina Faso, Niger and Chad, where the governments fought against terrorist groups like ISIS, Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda, together with the French. The Islamist insurgency is far from being defeated in Sahel, and currently, the Russian military is substituting the French in these countries as an allied force. It also has gravely destabilized the governments in these countries, resulting in coups in Mali, Niger and Burkina Faso. In Chad, there has also been a rebellion going on against the government by dozens of rebel groups since 2016. This country is no stranger to political violence, and how the former president Idris Deby came to power via the 1990 coup. Many of the rebels from Chad fought in the Libyan civil war, and they eventually came back to fight the government. In 2021, Deby was killed in the rebel offensive. His son, Mohamed Deby, became the new president and proposed talks to end the civil war. In August 2022, the government signed a peace agreement with 42 opposition groups, but some of the most powerful rebel organizations, like FACT, opted out of joining. The war is ongoing as we speak. Another civil war is happening in the Central African Republic, another country which has suffered through several internal conflicts. The north of the country is mostly Muslim, while the south has a Catholic population. In 2013, the Seleka rebel group, mainly consisting of Muslims, attacked and captured the capital Bangui and installed its leader, Michael Dotajia, as the new president. But their grip on the country was not really solid, as the militants from the predominantly Christian anti balaka group started resisting Seleka. Both sides were committing atrocities. In 2013, France launched an intervention to disarm the rebels. The African Union force, which was also deployed to restore order in the CAR, cooperated with the French. Their mission was not entirely successful, since the rebel activity and atrocities continued in the country. The civil war in the Central African Republic has become a sectarian conflict, with the country's territory largely divided along religious lines. The election of President Faustin Toadera, who has opted to bring in the Wagner mercenaries, has not changed much, as the government's control beyond the capital is quite weak. Attempts to reach a peaceful resolution to the conflict have all failed so far. West Africa is generally considered relatively more stable and prosperous in comparison with the rest of the continent, but it has not been devoid of conflict either. Nigeria has been fighting a Boko Haram and ISIS insurgency for more than a decade. The United Nations has assessed the death toll in this conflict to exceed 350,000, while 2.4 million people have become internally displaced. Nigeria has also been fighting against the separatist Niger Delta Republic in the oil-rich southern states of the country since 2003. The local population and ethnic minorities like the Ogoni people populating this area have complained of the environmental degradation of the region and insufficient economic benefits from oil revenues. It eventually escalated into a violent conflict between the government and rebel groups, which have been targeting the oil infrastructure, among other things. This conflict is still ongoing and has actually expanded its geography. Now, the Nigerian government is also fighting an insurgency in Biafra, a region that once had a short-lived independent state in the 1960s. The Biafran conflict also spread to the Bakasi region of Cameroon, where the pro-independent Biafra Nations League is fighting against the Cameroonian and Nigerian armies. Cameroon is also currently fighting the Ambazonian separatists in the south of the country, which is also known as the Anglophone Crisis. Another separatist struggle in West Africa is happening in the Casamance region of Senegal. There, the movement of democratic forces of Casamance started demanding autonomy or independence from Dakar, which has led to violence between them and the government. At this point, the government forces look to be in control of the situation, but occasional violence still occurs. Sudan has been in the headlines in recent years for all the wrong reasons. War, genocide, atrocities, fragmentation, and now war again. 
Another civil war started in Sudan in April 2023 by the Rapid Support Forces of Sudan, formerly known as the Janjaweed Militias, accused of perpetrating atrocities in Darfur. The RSF has captured some important land, including the majority of the capital region, but neither side has a decisive advantage at this point. There is also another rebel group called the Sudan People's Liberation Movement, fighting in the civil war. Russia and the UAE have been accused of supporting the rebels, and Wagner fighters have been seen acting in Sudan. East Africa is also marred in war. Several internal conflicts are going on in Ethiopia. The Tigray People's Liberation Front and the Tigrayan elite have been an important component of the Ethiopian ruling coalition since the end of the military rule. But the new Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, tried to reform the political system, then removed key Tigrayan members of the coalition warmed relations with Eritrea, and was accused of harming the federalist system of Ethiopia. All these factors eventually led to clashes between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray People's Liberation Front in November 2020. Eritrea also supported Ethiopia in this conflict. Although initially the government forces gained the upper hand and captured the Tigrayan capital, Mikele, by November 2021, the tide in the war had turned as the Tigrayans and the Oromo Liberation Army progressed towards the Ethiopian capital, Addis Ababa. Since then, the government managed to stabilize the situation, but could not overpower their adversaries. Hence, two years after the war in November 2022, the sides agreed to stop fighting. But the political conclusion of the conflict has not been reached yet, which threatens to destroy the fragile peace in Ethiopia. The fact that the internal conflict between the Ethiopian government and the Oromo and Amhara people is still going on is a further risk to stability and peace in one of the oldest countries in the world. One of the bloodiest wars in Africa has been going on in Somalia, with more than one million people killed according to some estimates. The internal conflict, in which local factions, various rebel groups, Islamist fundamentalists, along with foreign countries like Ethiopia, Kenya, the United States, and international military missions like that of the UN, have all taken part in some shape, has been going on since the 1980s and has turned this strategically isolated country into a failed state. The war started when the United Somali Congress toppled President Barre. However, the power vacuum was not filled up by a single united opposition and several rebel groups started fighting amongst each other. In the north, Somaliland declared its independence. The rest of Somalia became a battlefield too. The UN peacekeeping mission led by the United States was sent in to help stabilize the situation, but it was a tall task at this point. In 2000, the transitional national government was established in an attempt to restore order and political power in Somalia. The Ethiopian military backed them, and initially restored their control over the capital Mogadishu. But fundamentalist groups like the Islamic Courts Union and Al-Shabaab continued fighting against what was now an internationally recognized government of Somalia. Ever since, the Somalian government, backed by the African Union troops, have been fighting against the Islamist groups to regain control of the lost territories. In 2011, they pushed the insurgents out of Mogadishu and have been gradually making progress against them in the rest of the country. The Somali civil war has paved the way to other related sources of instability, such as the rise of piracy on the Somalian coast, which was largely contained by an international coalition. Another conflict is happening between Somaliland and the Katumo state of Somalia for control of the Sul region. The Democratic Republic of the Congo has been marred in conflict since the emergence of the independent state. One of the oldest still active conflicts is the Katanga insurgency in the south. The Katangese people have been fighting the government for secession since 1963, and though the conflict has become less intensive, it does not mean that the rebels have surrendered. For instance, in early 2022, the Katanga militants captured a settlement for a brief period to remind people about them before retreating. Another bloody ethnic conflict in DRC is known as the Ituri conflict. Tens of thousands have been killed in the conflict between two ethnic groups in the Ituri region. The French-led European Union peacekeeping mission deployed to Ituri in 2003 has curbed violence to some extent, but both sides are still carrying out atrocities against the other to this day. Another protracted conflict is going on in the Kivu provinces of DRC with spillovers in Rwanda and Burundi. Initially, the fighting broke out between the government on one side and the rebel Hutu forces on the other, 
but since then, the Mai Mai rebels, the M23 organization, and other insurgent groups have joined the fighting. This is a complex conflict with ever-shifting alliances, which has caused significant death and destruction in Congo. The UN has deployed its peacekeepers to the region to curb violence, but the war in the eastern DRC has not stopped. Another group fighting both the DRC and Uganda militaries, along with the UN peacekeeping mission, is the Allied Democratic Forces, consisting of the Ugandan Muslims. The ADF is supported by ISIS and operates from militant camps on the mountainous border of DRC and Uganda. The ADF and ISIS attacks on civilians in Uganda and DRC happen quite often. Another insurgency in Uganda is waged by the Christian fundamentalist group called the Lord's Resistance Army. This organization has been accused of killing more than 100,000 civilians and kidnapping tens of thousands of children in a quest to create a state based on the Ten Commandments. The 2006 peace agreement between the state and the group has disintegrated, but the LRA has significantly weakened in recent years, with its leader Joseph Kony on the run. Going further south, we have Angola fighting the Cabinda separatists. Kabinda is an enclave separated from mainland Angola by the territory of DRC and has demanded independence from Portugal even before Angola became independent. Initially, the conflict was fought along the Cold War lines, with the USSR, Cuba and other socialist countries supporting Angola, while the US, France and Belgium were accused of supporting Kabinda. In 2006, a ceasefire was signed between the Kabindan organizations and the Angolan government as the former agreed to a special status within Angola. Despite this, some groups demanding independence continue guerrilla warfare in Cabinda. To close the Africa chapter of this video, let's briefly touch upon the Cabo Delgado conflict in which jihadist groups are fighting against the Mozambican army, supported by several African nations, to establish an Islamic state. The conflict started in 2017. It has mostly been going on in the gas-rich province of Cabo Delgado, with spillover to other territories in Mozambique and neighboring Tanzania. The jihadists currently control part of Mozambique. 526,000 people die each year due to wars, according to the Geneva Declaration on Armed Violence and Development. Millions more get injured and displaced, witness their homes, villages, cities, and entire livelihoods disappear in the blink of an eye. But the sad reality is that all this suffering does not stop humans from fighting each other. And thanks again to Conflict of Nations. Join in on their new American Civil War scenario for free. Use our link in the description and also grab an exclusive gift. 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free, but only for the next 30 days. We will continue covering modern conflicts on our channel to keep our audience updated about them and shine light on the destructive nature of war. To keep up with this and much more, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.